Okay, so um, welcome everybody to this presentation about SC Linux. Um, I'm happy to take questions during the talk, so just go to the microphone. Um, if you find a funny TikTok or something during the talk. Too low? Do I, does it, is it better now? Okay, so I was just saying if you find a funny TikTok during the talk, uh, you can bring it to the microphone so everybody can hear it. Um, but yeah, so who am I? I'm Filippo Bonazzi. I'm a security engineer here at SUSE. Um, I work out of home in, in Turin, Italy, um, and I'm part of the proactive side of the security group. Uh, security group does a lot of things. I mainly do code review, code audits, and so on, but mainly SC Linux stuff. And so, as you know, SC Linux hasn't been you know, massively present at SUSE, but we do have a few people in the company that work with it. Historically, it was mostly Johannes uh, Zegitz. Nowadays, we also have Kathy, who, and, and myself. Um, and we do, let's say, we support the tool chain, in the SC Linux tool chain in factory. Uh, we support a, a policy, as an as Linux policy in factory, and we do general support for, for bugs and so on. Then in, in recent years, we've had um, a couple of uh, SUSE products that have picked up uh, SC Linux, and they have their own policies, for example, SLE Micro, and we do have Zdenek and Guyana, for example, that are working in this SC Linux area on, uh, on SLE Micro, and then, we, of course, we have ALP, which will be then uh, more the focus of this talk. Um, as, I, as I say this, we are looking to fill a position for an SC Linux uh, maintainer, a dedicated person for SC Linux policy maintenance out of our group, out of the security group. So we are definitely growing our SC Linux presence uh, in the company and you can find us all in the Discuss SC Linux Slack channel, which I'm sure you know has a lot of interesting and funny content, so just, just go there. All right, so today we'll be talking about a couple of things. Mostly, I'll be giving a fairly high-level introduction to SC Linux, how to reason about it, how to think about it, what it's doing at a fairly high level. I'm not going to go into too much technical detail. Um, and then we're going to see how it's specifically decline then on uh, on ALP, for example, uh, with the new use cases of uh, of such systems like Sleep Micro and ALP. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we have a varied, uh, varied SC Linux experience in the audience, so let's just start from, a, you know, a basic definition that will make everybody in the audience an expert on SC Linux. Um, so what what is SC Linux? SC Linux is a labeling system right? Every process has a label. Every file, directory, system object, and so on has a label. Rules control access between labeled processes and, and labeled objects. And the kernel enforces the rules. That's, that's all. That's SC Linux. <laughs> yeah, we're done. <laughs> that's, that's really all, all there is to it. Yeah. Uh, but no, uh, I mean, I think we have we have someone in the in the audience that is wearing an interesting shirt. <laughs> so we, we definitely have someone that is a bit more used to SC Linux. Um, but uh, but yeah, so no, re yeah, it just <laughs> yeah. So but what what's what's SC Linux? Well, uh, first of all, it's a mandatory access control system. Um, and it's based on the concept of a policy, right? So how, how does it compare, for example, to the traditional Unix uh, discretionary access control, the, the classic Unix permissions? Well, if you think of the classic Unix file permissions, uh, first of all, they are very much distributed. So, of course, each file defines its own permissions. So if you want to reason about, I don't know, a directory tree or, you know, anyway, a bunch of files, you have to go over each one of them to find out the access control information. While in SC Linux, uh, by its very design, uh, the access control information is centralized in the policy. So you have one single place that you can design and then analyze to figure out all of the access control information in the system. Um, the second aspect of traditional Unix uh, discretionary access control 
is that permissions are defined by the owner of a resource. So the owner of a file can decide, for example, you know, the classic Unix permissions, what can the owner do, what can the group do, what can everyone else, everybody else do. That's not like that in, in SC Linux, and that's the whole point of it. So SC Linux access control is administratively controlled. So whoever writes and installs the policy, let's call them the system administrator, um, then gets to decide who in the system can do what on, on what resources, right? Another point of um, difference between, you know, um, discretion access control and, and SC Linux in particular is that SC Linux is based on a whitelist approach. So by default on a system where you just install SC Linux and don't do anything else, of course you can't exactly do this in practice for, for very good reason, on such a system uh, you couldn't do anything because everything is forbidden by default. Um, this is of course a very secure system, uh, but uh, <laughs> not, uh, not a very useful one. So then the, the point of SC Linux that you have to explicitly allow explicitly allow all of the access that you want to have, um, and that's it. So you can think of it a little bit like a firewall for, for system calls. So whatever you tell it to let through, it will, and whatever you don't or you forget, uh, <laughs> then it will not go through ever. Um, so let's, let's make a funny example of this, for example. Yes, uh, please, please use the microphone. And this encodes all system calls, everything? Pretty much, yeah. So when I make a normal open or read on a file, if you don't it's, it's the call per se is denied or yes. is, it, is the access to the file denied? So whenever, so SC Linux is in the kernel, so whenever you go through the kernel with a system call, uh, the access will get checked. If you have that SC Linux permission, then you will succeed, otherwise you won't. So you can have a very, very interesting combination where, for example, you have open but not read, so you can't do much with a file. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's fine grain like that. So at the, at the individual system call uh, level. But yeah, so let's. But this require with the, at least the minimum of processes you have to run that you need to have a, a quite big whitelist from the beginning, that That's... the system can, can boot at all. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The policy has to be very structured. You have to have a lot of stuff just to make the system work, especially in more recent policies, for example, where you're also confining parts of the kernel itself. So uh, it does take uh, some initial setup, but not from the user, right? So it's all in the policy. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so let's 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 see, for example. Uh, a humorous example of, of access control. Let's say that I have a cat and a dog. Um, they all have their own food. Um, how do I make sure that you know this this happens? I can have SC Linux, uh, for example, and then I can say, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's a valid solution. Um, for example, I can I can state the following rules. I can say, well, the dog can eat the dog food, and the cat can eat the cat food. So what's what's the effect of this? Well, the dog can eat the dog food all right, and, and the cat can eat the cat food all right. But if the dog tries to eat the cat food, well, the kernel will stop him. Uh, we all have a penguin in the kitchen, apparently. Um, a side effect of the fact that we are talking about a whitelisting system is that the dog, or the cat for that matter, um, cannot eat anything else at all in my house that I forgot about or that I wasn't thinking about. So since I, sa I just said that it can eat the dog food and that's all it will get access to. So that's a good side effect. All right, so that's um, all, very, all very nice with cats and dogs, but maybe to be a little bit more formal. Um, so S Linux is a, is a practical implementation of a few uh, theoretical Mac schemes that are, I would say, very well known in the literature, um, and these schemes are type enforcement, uh, role-based access control, uh, multi-level security, multi-category security, and all of this stuff has been implemented together to make a coherent mechanism, access control mechanism. And you can see this if you see, for example, um, the labels that we were talking about before, the SC Linux label, 
which is also called the security context. You can see that it has a few parts. It has a user part, system U, then it has a role part, and these two parts uh, belong to the role-based access control part of it. It has a type part, which belongs to the type enforcement part, and then it has a sensitivity and category that below the multi-level, multi-category security. Out of these mechanisms, well, they're all, they're all important, but the, the key one that pretty much defines your SC Linux experience uh, when you work with it is type enforcement. So what does type enforcement do? It restricts, as we were saying just before, uh, actions on the system, which are system calls uh, when, you, when you dig deep enough. It restricts uh, these actions based on the involved parties and the SCLinux policy. So what does it actually do? Well, first of all, you have to identify who's, who's trying to act, who the involved parties are. And you do this by checking the security context, as we've just seen, and you figure out the type of the process, for example, is trying to do something, and that's also called a domain. Then you identify the type of the system resource that is trying to act on, and then you check is there you know, a rule in the policy that says this domain is allowed to perform this action on this type? If such a rule exists, then we go through, otherwise we don't. So what do these rules actually look like in the policy? Well, that's what they, that's what they are, really. They just say, well, I'm explicitly allowing here a domain to perform some actions defined by the permissions so read, execute, and so on, on a class, say a file or directory or whatever, that has a given type, right? For example, in, in this case here, we are allowing the initRC domain to uh, read and execute and so on, a file, or all files, rather, that have the PostgreSQL XXT type, right? So that's all very well and good, and if I try to start my database, um, I, I can. Like I can, I, my, my init process now can execute my PostgreSQL database. Um, but as you know, the, the process tree in a, in a Linux system is hierarchical, right? So the, 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 the PostgreSQL gets created by, by the init system in this case, or could be by, by, by the user, but let's say it's the init system. So how, does, how do we confine the PostgreSQL um, system, um, process well enough? Because in this case, we just said, well, the init can execute this file, but then, for example, PostgreSQL will want to do its own stuff. I don't know, write to the database, for example. Do we want to allow the init system to write to the database? Well, no, of course not. So we need to be able to identify once we have executed the, the, the PostgreSQL process, we need to be able to identify that we have become the PostgreSQL process and we are no longer the init system. And how do we do that? Well, we use this second fundamental type of rule that is called a type transition rule. So a type transition is a very simple kind of rule that says that when a domain executes um, a file like executable type um, with a given type, then the resulting process will have a well-defined resulting type right here. So to complete this example, let's say when the initRC domain executes something that is labeled PostgreSQL XECT, the resulting process that will be spawned will have the PostgreSQL T domain. Right? And so now we have become the PostgreSQL process and we are confined by SLinux. Linux. So let's, let's see an example uh, of this. A very, very, very simplified example, of course, and, and we'll see why. So let's say, <laughs> let's say that we have this app, this is a simple shell script, and this is a very useful piece of software that reads a configuration file and echoes it back into a log file, and, and, and that's all we do. Uh, so how do we how do we how do we how do we confine this with SLinux? 
Well, first of all, we're going to have to define a bunch of types, right? So let's say, let's define, for example, that when our utility is running, it's going to be running under the myAppT domain, right? And then we also need to define the context of our files in this case. So for example, we want to say that our shell script on disk will be uh, labeled myAppExecT. And for example, our configuration file that we just saw will be myAppConfT, and our log file will be myAppLogT. So what does this then allow us to do? It allows us to say, for example, that the myAppT domain can open and read a file that, is, uh, that has a myAppConfT type, and the myAppT domain can open, write, append, and so on, and create a file that has the type myAppLogT, right? So our, our log file. Is that all? Well, no. We still need to allow let's say, to, to, to start our process, right? So how do we do that? Well, this is a user utility, let's say. So it will be started by a user. So we need to say, well, when the user executes something that has the label and the type myAppExecT, the resulting application shall have the myAppT domain. And then we also actually need to allow the user to open and, and execute the, the actual shell script file that has the myAppExecT um, type. So that's very, very, very simple. Of course, it's, it's so simple to the point of being wrong, let's say. <laughs> you, don't, you don't really write policy like that. Um, there are a lot more concepts to, to, to write an SCLinux policy. You don't spell out permissions individually, you use macros, you don't write 70,000 allow rules, you use interfaces and so on. There are a lot of higher level of abstraction uh, constructs that you can use when you write um, uh, a policy module to, to confine an application. But in the end, what you will end up having uh, will be a module that confines an application. And that module will have three, you know, three parts. A T file, the type enforcement file, which will contain all of the allow rules that we've just seen, right? So we'll have everything that our application is allowed to do. Then it will have a file context file that will define what types correspond to all the files that our application interacts or that all that our application provides, let's say, our executable, configuration files, and so on. And then we'll also usually have an interface file that is just a way to provide the rest of the policy with the means to interact with our application uh, with Selenux. So let's say I, I define a, a file and I want other applications to be able to use it. I can provide a helpful interface that says, well, access the myapp.t file and other applications can just use that interface in the policy and not have to spell it out manually. Right, so that was, uh, let's say, general high-level introduction to, to SE Linux on traditional, or maybe more the, the concept of, of SE Linux. And that's how it's been working for, for several. Yes, we have a question. How do you extend this to network? Uh, well, uh, for example, a network port is an object that um, SLinux can confine. So for example, you can say allow such and such to interact with this port, or a socket, or something like that. So... But that's just a device. Yeah. But that's the but way... You just make a, a rule that the port gets uh, labeled something, and then you, you, you can say Okay, but, but this way you just control the device, not where maybe a connection is coming from or going to. Well, that's out of the scope of, of an access control system. So an access control system is by definition local uh, to the machine, right? So we stop at the, at the interface level to the outside. Yes. Do we have, do we have a microphone? 
There is a really weird part of a C Linux, which I don't Just know one. if anybody uses, <laughs> uh, that you can make labels even on IP packets. And you can make like these uh, MLC and M MCC on, so that the captain IP packet can get only to the captain computer and not to the sergeant computer and all this. But I, I, I don't know if ever, uh, everybody ever uses it, but uh, I have never seen it in, in action, but it is in the uh, system. Right, yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, on, on Linux, as you know, everything is a file. So <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah. All right, so going back to uh, you know, a traditional Linux system that we all know, where you have applications running. Um, most applications then are, are covered by uh, what's called a targeted policy, right? So for example, let's say we have our database running. It will be covered by a policy that knows about it. It's a well-known application, and it will be uh, well-confined. For example, uh, by, by, will be uh, well confined by a, by a specific module uh, that targets it, right? So, for example, on our current SINUX policy that we have on Tumbleweed, we have over 450 modules uh, that target as many or more um, applications. Uh, but some applications also provide their own SINUX module, uh, for example, uh, Cockpit for, for some reason. But this is just to say an order of magnitude of, of um, what a typical policy, desktop or server policy, is like on a traditional system, and this is all. And this all works, let's say, right? But now we move to Alp, um, not only Alp, but let's say we move to a system that has a very small core, and all of the workloads, all of the application, everything that's interesting, is running inside a container, right? Well, of course, the, the core and then the, 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 the small system is still covered by the targeted policy that worked before. There's no difference there. But now all of the stuff is running in containers. So do we, do we lose SC Linux here, or, or what can we do? Well, we can do th two things, really. Um, so first of all, SC Linux can still protect the system from the containers. And then it can also protect uh, the containers from each other, which is still quite significant. How do we do that? So this is where the container SC Linux uh, policy comes in. This is not really a policy module, it's more of an independent project that has been built to handle containers and container runtimes specifically. Um, and it defines a few, a few domains, a few types. So for example, the container runtime itself, uh, I don't know, Podman or what have you, uh, is confined in the container runtime T domain. So it will have a specific defined set of things that it can do, among which, of course, to execute uh, the containers. And then the containers that are spawned by the container runtime will, of course, need to transition to more specific container domains. Of course, we don't want all containers to run under container runtime T. So normal containers, you know, the box standards one that you can just start, run under container T. Um, this is a domain that is quite restrictive. Um, it has some generic, you know, common read uh, permissions. For example, you can read and execute most labels that are uh, unproblematic under USR, for example. It can generally read configuration files under ETC and so on. Nothing special. What's really quite special about the container T domain is that it can only write to this container file T type. So whatever um, normal container writes to any file will get the type container file T if you don't do anything else. Um, and this is of course quite contained, right? Of course, the, 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 what the container will write to the system will be only accessible to the container uh, context, let's say, right? Um, so let's say I spawn more than one container. How does that work? Then is it all a big container T? They all write and read and then handle and mess with each other's stuff. Well, no, obviously not. 
If you remember, uh, when we looked at the uh, Linux security context before, uh, there were a few, a few um, bits in it. And the final one here is this uh, multi-category security that we very briefly skipped. Um, but that's basically a way to define multiple independent versions of a given type, right? So you define the type with the normal type enforcement, and then you add this MCS mechanism on top that will say we'll have this label with category zero or this label with category one, and those will be for the purpose of type enforcement, the same type, but for the purpose of the wider SC Linux, not quite the same. Um, so you see, you see where this is going, obviously. So now, for example, we can have the container runtime itself assign different categories to the containers it's spawning. Um, and here we have an example of uh, this lovely, uh, lovely topic of con uh, category dominance. If you can't sleep at night, I can highly recommend it. But the, <laughs> the gist of it is that um, the container runtime assigns, in practice, a pair of categories um, to each container, and that makes it so that you can have, for example, a category that is only assigned to one container, or a category that is shared, or, for example, um, you can have um, at least at least the pair is is unique to a container. So you can have a lot of combinations of of access across uh, different containers with different categories. What if you need even more than that? You want to you don't want to be bothered. You want to do some special stuff, some privileged stuff. Well, you can use the super privileged container, uh, which is as dangerous as it sounds exactly. Uh, and this is basically unconfined, um, and it can pretty much do uh, everything that the container runtime can do. Uh, so as you can imagine, this is a bit much. Uh, there are uses for it, it exists. But let's say if you are running an actual workload that is to, needs to do something more interesting than you know, just bog standard container T, but you don't want to just shoot yourself in the foot and, and do everything in a super previous container and just break havoc on your system. What can you do then? Uh, well, there's a middle ground. There is this lovely tool that has been developed by the Upstream Containers Project, and it's called Udica, uh, which probably here in, uh, in, in, in Czechia, may, probably many people will know what it means. I, I understand it's a Slovak word, in fact which means a fishing rod. Um, it, it doesn't exactly, let's say, it's, it's, a, it's a way of saying that with this tool, you can learn to catch your own fish, and you don't have to be you know, hand-fed. Um, but the point is that this tool allows you to generate a policy module for your container automatically based off of your container description that you have provided, for example, by your, by your container runtime here. Um, of course, as, as every automated tool, uh, this can be, still needs to be reviewed, but this is <laughs> quite useful. Because, for example, say that you start your container with, a, for example, with a mount. You say, spawn this container mounting this directory and, and, and binding to this specific port. Then you can do like that. Uh, you can read the, um, inspect the container description from, from, the, from Podman, for example feed it into this generator, Udica, and it will generate you a policy that allows exactly access to your mount and exactly binding to your port, but nothing more. Um, so this is then um, an interesting middle ground when you want to confine a container with, uh, with a CDNUX without going to either extreme. And yeah, that's uh, really all I wanted to say for this talk. I'm aware uh, this is a lot of theory, and we didn't quite look at you know so much technical stuff, commands, and uh, what, what happens when something goes wrong because it never does, right? So that's, there's no need to. <laughs> but no, really, if you if you want to get more technical, well, I can recommend this lovely talk, but my by my colleague uh, Johannes Zegitz. Um, well, you can't quite read the link, but if you get the slides, you can click it. And this and other resources are available in our Slack channel that I mentioned before. 
And if you want to get some hands-on practice, you can also come to the SC Linux workshop that Johannes will hold uh, next week at OpenSUSEcon in, in Nuremberg. So there's also that. Um, and with that, I'm open to any other questions, which we have one already. Is it more of a comment or? A slight <laughs> comment. Uh, you probably freaked out everybody uh, by saying that uh, only whitelisted actions are allowed, which is strictly speaking true, but the only one system uh, was really strict about it. It's called Fedora 3. And uh, its uh, main feature was that it completely didn't work because it was like a computer for NSA, so uh, it was crazy. So uh, they introduced a label unconfined for most of the stuff. So strictly speaking, so Linux doesn't allow anything which is uh, allowed, but most uh, a lot of stuff is labeled unconfined, which is allowed a lot of uh, fit. So it's kind of actually it is blacklisted well, in, in the end. Yeah, so yeah. In, in practice, so I mean, yeah, it, it, it was technically correct, which is always the best kind of correct, but in practice you are absolutely right. Then most desktop and server policies, among which uh, the one that we have in, in OpenSUSE, Tumbleweed, for example, of course, for example, run the users, most gen generic users, as unconfined. So whatever you do, will not be stopped by SC Linux. But of course, you can confine a user as well and, yeah. So when, the, when now for, let's say, every system call, a reaction uh, is looked, whether it's permitted or not, yes. what's the performance impact on the, on the system when you run uh, it in that mode? I would say minimal to non-existent. Uh, there were some tests about like less than but that was probably, I, I mean, I, I remember reading something in the literature, but probably from 20 years ago, that it was this, this little, it's probably even less. Uh, but yeah, of course, I mean, of course, by definition, there will be some, but yeah. So does that uh, depend all of N from the number of rules that you've defined in the system or like fixed due to whatever percentage? Uh, sorry. Uh, the, the performance impact, does that depend on the number of rules? Defined I have no idea. I have no idea. Well, mm, that's really an implementation detail I would expect. So you know, with a naive implementation, I can absolutely see if you have a million or 70 billion rules and you have to go, is this the one? Is this the one? Then yeah, but you don't do that. You probably have a map of some kind. I mean, it's in the kernel after all, so I would expect it to be well done. Yeah, so follow don't up laugh, but <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> So in the previous uh, presentation, we heard about um, edge devices and Slim Micro, and uh, we made the, um, the impression there that on first boot, SE Linux takes quite a while to initialize. And I wonder whether you could comment on what exactly is going on there technically, and whether there is any chance to, for example, do part of that at build time rather than at first boot. What do you mean uh, at first boot is quite... Uh, like upwards of one minute the system is hanging there and doing some kind of SE Linux process? Well, that can be. So what needs to happen on, on a system uh, is that files need to be labeled, right? Of course, you need to, you need to apply a label to, to, to each object in the file system and so on. If and you are not generating, that could be done by Kiwi already, or does it, you know, depend on like hardware identifiers of the actual USB drive or something like that? Uh, microphone, microphone, no microphone. <laughs> I just mentioned that uh, Kiwi can relabel the file system before packing the image, so it should be pre-labeled uh, or labeled from the start. Yeah. But then, of course, whatever you generate on the spot or change or so, th there might still be some relabeling to do. Yes. There's also the problem that after every update, everything has to be relabeled, or in theory, even after every rollback to a to a previous snapshot or booting of a previous snapshot, because the labels could have been changed in the meantime uh, during the update. So in theory. Yeah, every reboot would have to relabel the whole system. 
that is um, a whole can of worms. I have conveniently left it out of the slides. Um, <laughs> but yes, you are absolutely correct. Of course, um, file system labels live on the file system, while the policy lives is loaded in the live in the live system, right? So, whenever you effectively swap out one file system for another, when you load a new snapshot, well, then you'll you'll have to have some realignment or relabeling for sure. Whenever, for example, you update the policy, then you might have to relabel the whole thing. Uh, and going back is, is not easier. Yes, a microphone. So just to make that point clear, do you need file systems that support storing labels? Yes, yes. yes. So it's one thing, attributes. yes, one thing I did not mention uh, is that compared, for example, to other, other access control systems, SC Linux bases all of its, uh, so the place where the labels are stored is extended file system attributes. Um, I think most file systems nowadays support it. Well, it can be a problem with NFS and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, but that's not local, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, Right, any, any other questions or everybody wants to go to lunch? Yes, uh, that's the mic there as well. In your opinion, who's responsible for creating the, the rules and policies, especially for ISV applications and especially for ISVs who cannot anticipate all the different configurations and ways their software is deployed? Well, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a... It's a um, Unfortunately, it's a very valid question. Um, so there are many, many hands that can uh, create a piece of a policy. Um, there is one policy that comes from Fedora, for example. We do some changes on that. Um, but then, for example, all of our products have a specific policy with specific, let's, let's call them patches, but anyway, changes, right? Uh, so you would have to provide something specific for your system with the possibility to allow it to be flexible in that case, something like we've seen for containers, right? So you could think of a generic workload and make it do something generic enough or maybe generate something specific enough, if you, if you see where I'm going. But we can talk about it offline. I'm not right. sure I can offer any more specific answer here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, one more question. How do you deal with uh, new devices? If I, by device. if I just plug in my headset, how is the audio device labeled? Um, good question. I'm not sure. Um, I would expect it to be covered by the system audio configuration which already exists, which is most likely already covered in the policy. So it should all be, let's say, I mean, your, your headset that you plug in. I'm, I'm making a, a toy example again here. We'll probably end up... Uh, with its stuff called, I don't know, headset type file T. Because a headset is a generic object that you can have many of. If you see what I'm trying to get at. Of course, it's not as simple as that. But there's nothing specific about, about a headset. Um, the, the concept of the headset is already baked in the, 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 the audio system and then the SC Linux policy that, that covers it. Does yeah, that? Yeah, that as well. <laughs> but you could be more, even more specific than that. Does that answer the question? Well, I would say try it. Try it, plug it in and check. <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned the tool for containers. Could there be something similar when I have any, any software running to find out what this software touches that the system is sort of a, in, a, in a learning mode or in a, in a propagating mode so that uh, afterwards you have some some rough uh, scheme which you then probably have to check and then convert to a policy well yes there are three parts to this answer well the first part is most of this work has been done for you already by the policy designer and more specifically by your distribution maintainer if you are doing something else, uh, which can, can happen, you can set, for example, SC Linux to permissive, which is something like um, um, learning. It's not quite a learning mode, but you can set it to permissive, which means that actions will succeed, but 
uh, it, what would be a failure will be logged. So the action will go through, but you will see I blocked such and such from doing such and such. And from that, you can kind of work backwards then to allow it in the policy. But I would stress that since, as you might have understood, SE Linux is a very top-down system, so it's a very design-based system. Whenever you provision an application or you, you, you provide, you build an application, you know what it does, or at least I would, <laughs> I would hope so. And then you're supposed to then, or you're supposed to, what you can do is to provide the policy for it. So for example, you know, well, this is my database, this is my log file, this is my custom device, I'll write a policy module for it. Yeah, but you first have to create this policy module. And if you have a really big application, uh, I, I doubt that you know upfront what this application is doing can, to the full extent. It can be done iteratively, so of course you can start with a rough idea, well, you hopefully have a rough idea at least yeah. of your application and then you can uh, put the system or even just your application domain in permissive mode, see what it would trigger, what violations it would trigger and then go back and improve the policy, try again and so on. Um, of course, I wouldn't expect you to wake up one morning and type it out from scratch, correct? <laughs> you can try, uh, yeah. Any any other questions? Yes. So if I understand it correctly, most of the security of that SA Linux provides to the system is coming from the policy, right? So the policy is actually defining. The policy the, is the brain. Yes. Yes. Um, how are we reviewing the policy, or how are we are we allowing users to modify the policy? Is there a way to like include custom snippets, or? What's That's one area where still uh, practicality, um, let's say there is a trade-off between practicality and, and security. So on a hypothetical system where you want to confine really everything um, administratively, then you would have an administrator that would actually set up the system, confine the users, confine the applications, and lock it down mm -hmm. so that you cannot turn off a Linux by any means either at runtime or at boot, by changing you know, the bootloader configuration, you can't do any of these things, then the answer is yes, uh, everything's confined. On your own laptop, where you can say, enable SE Linux and set to enforcing, well, you can still go back. Say, you, you screw everything up, then you reboot, and you go in the kernel command line, and you say, permissive uh, yes, or rather enforcing zero, and you boot in permissive. So on a system that you manage, uh, you can make SC Linux help until a certain point, but turn it off or rather set it to permissive when you've screwed yourself over enough. On a system that is managed by someone else, then you can lock it down completely, but then again, uh, completely means completely. So uh, say that for example, you change the SC Linux policy remotely on a VM which you can't reboot and you screw it up. Uh, so, so, what yeah. <laughs> kind of, so, so what kind of confinement do we actually want to achieve with ALP, with the SLU policy for ALP? Well, I would say it's a general, um, general purpose operating system confinement where we are confining the applications um, rather than the users. Uh, a, a logged in user at a terminal is still unconfined mm -hmm. for most you know, uses and, and purpose, intents and purposes. And let me also say that this might depend on the product. If we create something, let's say, for a NSA, CIA type or very paranoid um, vertical, it might be different than if we do something for a big ISV application. Yeah. Definitely, but then again, this is exactly something that you would need to design. It's not something that you can hand wave and be like, well, let's just lock it down because then nothing works. Uh, you would need to design something to a specific setting and design it or rather customize the policy for it. Yes. And concerning the flexibility, there are uh, so-called booleans. So you can right. switch off some uh, or allow something. So for example, Dovecot uh, IMAP server, usually it's very strict where you can have your uh, mail storage 
but you can say actually I would like to have it in my home directory. That and is a very good uh, example. That's yeah. something actually we have seen, for example, Which on. I have uh, oh yeah, yeah, more than one. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's actually something we have seen, for example, on on microOS. Um, a specific example, microOS has the same sleep micro policy, and we had a case on microOS desktop where users that wanted to run, I forget now, was it Wine or some kind of game? I, I don't know. Um, it wouldn't work. So of course they went on Reddit and they were like, it doesn't work. And you just have to turn on a Boolean that says allow, for example, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Steam on, on, on Linux requires stack execution, uh, which of course, um, for good reason, we don't allow in the, in the general policy. Uh, but if you want to harm yourself or play Steam, uh, then uh, yeah, turn it on on your system. I mean, it's not that bad, but still, it's disabled by default. Yes. So, so on the topic of the policy configuration, you mentioned that the cockpit package comes with its own set of uh, of rules. Yes. So, um, what is the idea of doing that for containers? You you know, I had one slide covering. Um, some uh, specific types there, but usually the idea is that you know you use a command like I don't know pull or something like that to get your container from a third party. You run it, and you might not have quite as much insights in it. And of course, those container commands, I'm not aware of actually delivering you like a as a Linux policy file. So you would then need to like additionally, in addition to obtaining the container, need to either write or download out of band a policy configuration file for your containers. Well, so this is once again, this lands somewhere in the, in the trade-off between practicality and confinement. So on a system where you want to lock stuff down, of course, you wouldn't expect a, system, a user at the terminal downloading a random container from malware.com and you know, uh, running it right then and there on a system with enforcing a Linux, it just doesn't. But if you want on a, on a practical system, well, then you can just, um, You'll, you'll run it as container T, and then you'll see, is it not enough? Uh, and then I'm not sure there is a, how can I call it, an end-to-end -end solution yet, right? Where you pull a random container with a random policy. I would argue that that kind of defeats the purpose um, in a way. So, the, um, for example, I mentioned that the cockpit package provides its own policy, but it's not like... You, you curl the policy off of a random website and, and, and load it. The policy is provided by the package in OBS and it has been reviewed as, you know, it makes sense. So it's, it's a custom policy module, but it's not like custom at runtime. It's custom in the sense that it's not in the SE Linux policy package, it's in another package, but it's still maintained and somewhat, let's say, somewhat reviewed by your distribution. But my understanding was that this Udica, or whatever yes. you pronounce yes. that tool, is, is somewhat different from the permissive mode in that it may actually miss some, um, like, you know, um, access policies that you might need to successfully run the container. That is entirely possible. Um, the, so Udica is a generator, policy generator, so it will let's say, read the container description and then declaratively create a policy that, for example, if you, if you as I was saying, uh, spawn a container with a mount, then there is a, a SLinux policy interface, for example, for um, accessing a file uh, or a directory tree. And so you will have in your custom module, say custom container, you will have an interface invocation that says, well, you can use this subtree. That is probably enough. Uh, or the same with, I don't know, ports, for example. You have an entity in the C Linux policy, a gen generic entity for binding to a port, and then you specialize it binding to this port, and you generate a policy with this. So in this case, once again, it's top-down, so you're generating something that is expected by design to cover your use case. If it doesn't work, you, you still might need to do something. I don't think it's that common for containers. I think this tool works uh, well enough. 
but uh, I haven't okay, run it extensively. But the expectation is you run the tool and then you review, potentially edit the output and then feed it into your system policy. Yes. Um, whereas if you actually wanted to run a Kubernetes cluster, where some of that is then going to be automatically and you don't know which container ends up on which host, you would need to have kind of manufacture like some kind of overarching umbrella config for all the eventualities and only then deploy what you know about? Mm, yes, I, I have to say that's going a bit further away from my direct experience, but I would say yes. There is a very similar tool for general, uh, it's called audit to allow. So uh. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I know. Uh, <laughs> Which is uh, that basically you switch, uh, turn your system to the permissive mode, then you lock all your uh, errors, and uh, then you can run the lock through this tool, and it will generate uh, some policy. Which uh, the problem is that it will allow uh, anything which would be broken, and sometimes it's like completely, uh, like yes, any process can do anything. So that that uh, satisfies yeah, the so rules. Of there are there are other tools. The, it should be. Uh, analyzed and uh, whether actually yeah. this is what you want or it's crazy but there is a difference so in the audit to allow it's, it's probably much better but uh, it's, it's it's a big difference in the in the sense that audit to allow just gets a list of violations and builds a policy like a policy a bit of policy that will allow whatever was uh, whatever um, resulted in that violation Regardless of whether it made sense, it was the right thing. I mean, potentially you could, you know, run an exploit and then say, "Ooh, I have a violation. Order to allow and allow your exploit." Right? While in this case, this is a programmatic generator that generates stuff that makes sense. I want to allow this director. I want to allow this port. Uh, this something else. Not. I want to allow everything in, in this pot. Any other questions? Brilliant, yeah, we can go to lunch. Uh, once again,